Hi, I'm Dr. Alan Rabinowitz. I'm here, here, here today to do a live Facebook feed to talk all about the Jaguar journey along the Jaguar corridor. I'm here to answer any of your questions about this incredible epic journey that we'll take on for the next three years or any other questions about Jaguars. Uh, and I'm, I'm also here to answer personal questions if you, if you so choose. So ask away and let's see if we can learn something today. Ben from New Jersey asks, what's the biggest threat to the Jaguar corridor? That's our biggest challenge, is thinking all the time, what's the biggest threat and where the biggest threat is to the Jaguar corridor. There are many, many threats to this corridor. The, what you need to understand is this is not just a forested corridor that Jaguars can move easily through. Parts of this car corridor are very good forests. Parts of it are cattle ranches, are oil palm plantations, are people's vegetable gardens, and the Jaguars sneak through at night in order to maintain what we call a genetic corridor. Any major construction could potentially break the corridor, a large dam, a four-lane highway, uh, a widening of the Panama Canal. But it's got to be pretty intense because jaguars are so clever and so indomitable that they know how to get by a lot of different kinds of obstruct obstructions. So the good news is it's not easy to break the Jaguar corridor. And if we know something could be breaking it, potentially, we can work with the government and with developers to make sure that the development happens and the Jaguar still can get through. This has been a really interesting interesting set of days for us. I feel very, very tired now, but I'm really enthused to be here and be able to talk to so many of you people about, about Jaguars. But in the last week or so, I and my team have been going through some incredibly rugged Jaguar country on the border between Panama and Colombia, in far northern Colombia, an area called the Darien Gap in the Choco region of Colombia. The Darien Gap is one of the biggest intact and most important contiguous forest areas left throughout Jaguar Range. It's so rugged that attempts to try to even build a road through this area in the past have failed, which is not a bad thing. Jaguars move through here very, very well. People also move through and hunt ja ja jaguars, but this is a very crucial area to keep intact because it's the, it's the connection point for all jaguars and all wildlife in, in north from Mexico, Central America, down into South America. It's all through the Darien Gap. Harry asks, are populations stable in Colombia? It's a, very, it's a very good question, and the answer is probably not as clear-cut as you would like. In some areas, in, in good protected areas, the populations are relatively stable. Females are bearing young and raising young. Unfortunately, throughout most of Colombia, they're not as stable and protected as they should or could be. There are terrific laws in place in Colombia. There are terrific attitudes about protecting the environment and protecting biodiversity. But unfortunately, there's still a lot of killing, a lot of poor law enforcement. And much of this is happening not only outside of protected areas, but some of it is happening inside of, of, of protected areas. Now, if your own home is being disturbed, it's very hard to maintain stability. That's our goal, is to try to make the Jaguar populations more stable, more, protect, more protected. John asks, 
can you talk about the swimming jaguar you posted the other day? Thanks, John. That's a great, a, a great question for me. We were actually going out with the military, with the Colombian military, out uh, to see some very rugged jaguar habitat, and it was in a somewhat dangerous area. So the so the military wa was accompanying us. Now, sadly, I didn't see that jaguar swimming. All I did was ask one of the young military men holding his machine gun, do you ever see or hear about jaguars in this area? And he smiles and says, you know what? Take a look at this and pulls out his cell phone and shows me that the day before on the same river we were going, he saw a jaguar swimming across and that's the video you see. And what you should be proud of, what I felt very proud of, more than the actual sighting of the jaguar, was that this, this young military man's first response to seeing a jaguar was not to point his gun, was not to speed up the boat and run the animal over, like happens in many places, but it was to take a video just for himself, just to show his family. He wasn't even going to show us unless we asked him. That kind of thing made me very happy. When the young people think, realize that's an incredible sight that should be protected, that your first response is to take a picture of it, not to point a gun at it, you're really making a lot of headway in the country. Okay, John asks, does Panthera do work with local populations and changing attitudes towards jaguars? Nyasa Lion Project does this quite a bit. That's in Africa. Just wondering if this was something that, that was needed. John, we do do that, and you're right, it is needed. What all of us in Panthera realize is that conservation doesn't occur without people. As much as many of us would like to just stay with the animals and study the, the, the animals and, and, and protect them, we've all been in the field long enough to understand that conservation can only occur if the people who you're asking to live with these animals truly believe it's a good thing to be living with these animals and usually have some benefit from living with these animals. Because there's always some non-benefit as well, some element of danger or, or conflict. So if they're willing to accept that, they need to have some of the benefit there. So, so yes, we do work with local communities. And just the other day here in Colombia, we went to investigate a conflict situation with a jaguar, which was very unusual, very sad. People died in the process. And we had to try to convince the local people and their children in particular that jaguars are not devils. This was a very, very rare event. And it hadn't ever happened before. It, it, it hasn't happened since the, the, the problem has been mitigated so that you don't become afraid of something just because of one aberrant incident. That's like being afraid to cross the street because somebody somewhere once got hit by a car. We, but this takes education, especially of the young people. Young people love animals. They're born loving animals. And they often change their attitudes towards a negative one due to the adults. We have to make sure that it's the young people that make changes in this world. Rhonda. Rhonda asks, are jaguars endangered by poaching or primarily environmental encroachment and human overlap? Great question, Rhonda. They're endangered by both. If you were to pick the number one in the past, what's so interesting is that in the past, there was a time when jaguars were most endangered by the killing of jaguars especially during 60s and 70s, during a big boom in the spotted cat coat fashion industry. Hundreds of thousands of jaguars and ocelots and spotted cats were being wiped out, completely wiped out of areas. 
in order to supply the fashion in, in, industry. With better protection, now that's still a problem. People killing cats as a preventive measure because they're seen as livestock killers or other things or people are afraid of them, that's still a big issue which education has to take care of. But it's no longer as big an issue as loss of habitat and as encroachment of the protected areas. We have created, countries have done pretty good jobs throughout Jaguar range of creating good protected areas for the countries. Not always with good enforcement, but, but at least with, with good laws and good protected areas. Many people know that they shouldn't shoot Jaguars anymore. There's no market for them. It's not like tigers. There's no real reason to be shooting Jaguars. So there's, that's less of a problem than people killing Jaguar food, taking away a lot of all the Jaguar food, all the, all the peccaries and deer and, and, and armadillo and paca. That will also kill Jaguars because Jaguars need that food to survive. And the encroachment into Jaguar land, taking away their habitat, that, that's like somebody coming in and taking away your own house or pieces of your house slowly until you're just stuck in one room of the house instead of the whole house. That's not good for the species. And that's become one of our major problems. Adam. Adam asks, which countries have been the most engaged with and receptive to the Jaguar corridor so far? Well, I have to tell you, Adam, we've been incredibly pleasantly surprised how every country has been, has been not only open to the concept of the Jaguar corridor, the genetic corridor, once they learn about it, but some countries which we weren't even involved in have openly invited us to come in and please sign agreements with them. The first country that ever signed the agreement, which really helped us kickstart the whole corridor, is where I am right now in Colombia. With the push of, of certain very high politicians in the government at that time, which has now run over into this current government, Colombia has had some very environmentally savvy and active governments. There, there's been plenty wrong, but they, they've they been trying very hard to set up parks and protected areas and preserve biodiversity. And most importantly, it was Colombia that was the first big signatory, because this is a very big, important country. It's one of the bookends, what we call, of the Jaguar Corridor, three bookends, Mexico, Colombia, and, and Brazil. So, Colombia has been one of our best and oldest partners for the Jaguar Corridor. Having said that, the governments we've worked in in every country, in Mexico, in Brazil, in Honduras, in Belize, they've been very open and very cooperative to trying to preserve Jaguars because it makes sense to them. It's something deeply ingrained in their culture it's something that they know shouldn't just be eliminated from the, the, the entire country, like has happened in El Salvador and Uruguay. El Salvador and Uruguay are the only two countries in Jaguar range where they've been totally extirpated. No country should have such an important symbol of, of its culture, of its history, extirpated, when in fact it can live with, with people. So we've been very, it's, it's actually been on us to, to try to keep up with the governments because they've been very willing to have us be act, play an active role in trying to protect Jaguars. Chloe, when's the last time you visited the Coxcomb Basin in Belize? What do you know of the Jaguar population since your initial research there? Chloe, it's been far too long since I visited the Coxcomb Basin. I did visit numerous times after my, my original research, and, and I was happier and happier and happier every single time because faster than I ever imagined, I saw that place becoming inculcated, becoming ingrained 
in the mindset of not just the government, which had no protected areas when I was there, but of the local people. The local people were basically, in a good way, recreating history, saying they created it, the Mayans created it. And, I, and that's terrific. They were taking ownership of it. They were making money out of it. They were, they were forming good models of ecotourism around it. They were doing crafts. They, they are doing crafts, which I had never seen them do before. They never even knew what a Mayan ruin was when I was in there. But the most important thing is that after I left, eventually, Panthera put in uh, an incredibly great team of scientists, Bart and Becky. Bart has done a Facebook Live before me on Jaguars from the Coxcomb. These two scientists have now done intensive research, much more than I ever did, and they have worked with the local people and brought about real sustainable conservation in the Coxcomb region. The funny thing is that Bart's best estimate for numbers of jaguars in the Coxcomb is very, very close to what my estimate was way back 30 years ago, which is not to say anybody did anything better or worse. It meant that that Coxcomb Basin was a beautiful site to affect as saving jaguars because it didn't have a lot of hunting, a lot of poaching. Mayan Indians were going in and taking things, but it wasn't really affecting the larger, larger population. Coxcomb started everything off. Coxcomb started the whole Jaguar corridor off. That's where, where I realized personally that creating one Jaguar preserve, creating 10 Jaguar preserves, creating 50 Jaguar preserves wasn't going to save the Jaguar. We had to save the Jaguar as a species throughout its entire range and grant it movement patterns so it could, it could, change with things like climate. People say, are you worried about climate change? I'm not worried about climate change for the species I work on because we give them corridors. We create movement paths for them so that they can do just as they had done in the Pleistocene in order to escape the ice ages. So when you look at the whole picture, you could save species. All right. Kwong. Kwong asks, would you say the Pantanal is where the jaguar populations are, are most abundant and stable? Another good question. Are they most abundant there? They're pre I'm not, I wouldn't say absolutely that that's the most abundant place in the world in jaguar range, but we do have some of the highest densities of jaguars known throughout Jaguar range in the, in the Pantanal. Part of that reason is because they feed on a lot of cattle. Now, are they the most uh, stable? They are now, or they're becoming so now. It, this was not in the past. Hunting was rampant in the Pantanal because Jaguars did take quite a few cattle because people allowed large herds of cattle just to free range throughout the whole Pantanal and basically cattle were walking into a jaguar's face. I mean, who wouldn't take that food? So all the jaguars were known by ranchers and by cowboys as, as, as anti-cattle. When in actual fact, jaguars will eat their normal prey and not travel very often into human landscape for, for a cow if they have abundant normal prey. But when you, when you let cattle roam out into the wild, into the jaguar's face, of course they're gonna take it. So many ranchers and cowboys were putting, were, were killing jaguars, many. Hundreds and hundreds of jaguars were being killed. There were even bounties put on jaguars. But it's turning around now, partly due to Panthera, partly due to, to other really great uh, Brazilian NGOs because now the area in the Pantanal is becoming the ecotourism center 
for going down and seeing jaguars. It's the only, one of the only places throughout Jaguar Range where, where during a certain time of year, you can reliably see jaguars, which is amazing. See them in a truly wild state by boat. Now, because of that, tourism that used to be local fishing, uh, just trips down there now has turned into jaguar tourism. And jaguars are now being valued by the locals, by the ranchers, as, as a source of new kinds of money and income. But ranchers who you're asking not to kill jaguars, even though jaguars might still take some of their cattle, have to benefit from that. We either, we either have to help them so that jaguars don't take their cattle by doing things the right way, or they have to benefit from the ecotourism dollars flowing into the area. So I would say in short to your question, right now, yes, the Pantanal has one of the best populations of jaguars left throughout Jaguar range. And right now, jaguar populations in the Pantanal are not only growing, but stabilizing throughout much of it. Alexandra. Alexandra asks, how do the attitudes of local populations along the Jaguar corridor compared to those of other humans living with big cats around the, the world? That's a very good question. That's a very long answer. <laughs> um, there are similarities and differences. The similarities are that any person, any place in the world living with a big predator near it is going to have fears and worries about what comes if they send their daughter to go get water from the nearest stream. What, what, what could happen if they go out at night in between their, their hut and their friend's hut without a flashlight or without any, anything because there are tigers around and leopards around and lions around or jaguars around. That kind of fear of living with a big predator is a justified fear. It's more justified, however, with some of the other cats than with jaguars. You'll find more fear of people living around tigers, lions, leopards, uh, even snow leopards, than you, you will of people living around jaguars. Why? Jaguars are different for some reason, and I can't tell you exactly why. I called it in my book, Jaguarness. All big cats are very similar in certain ways in terms of being cats. But each species is also very different. And jaguars are different from all the other species. And it's what I call jaguarness. And there's several aspects of jaguarness. But, but, but one of the most prevalent is that, that historically, while lions and tigers and, and leopards and even mountain lions have taken thousands and thousands of people, have killed thousands and thousands of people in the past, even though most of them don't bother people generally. There have been documentation in the past of thousands of killings. Jaguars, we have, there are probably more than we have documented, but we, we have documented less than a dozen known cases of jaguars, jaguars killing people without a reason. Jaguars just killing, killing people, coming in and ta taking people. There have been instances of people saying, I've been stalked by jaguars, I've been attacked by jaguars, but those, those are a little overplayed. I could say I've been stalked by, by a jaguar because I once was walking for almost an hour while the jaguar I thought I was following was right in back of me. But he wasn't stalking me to try to hurt me. He was curious about why I was stalking him. Big cats are very, very curious. So I do see differences in people who live around jaguars and who live around other big cats. I also see some differences in the culture. Even tigers are hugely ingrained in many of the cultures of, of Southeast Asia in particular. Cheetahs are ingrained in the culture, leopards are ingrained in the culture, but I have never seen it quite as ingrained as the, the jaguar culture, where they, where they became gods, 
where incredible temples had been built to them. The religious leaders were jag wore, wore the jaguar skins. The most powerful shamans be became wear jaguars, half man, half jaguar. The jaguar culture, which is one of the saddest things I'm seeing being lost throughout jaguar range, faster than the jaguars are being lost, is not a good thing because jaguar culture is one of the most amazing pieces of history uh, of our earth. Okay, Susie asks, why did you choose Colombia for your current journey? And why is Colombia an important part of the Jaguar Corridor? Great question, Susie. First of all, the Jaguar journey is going to cover 10 countries. There are 18 countries throughout the Jaguar Corridor, throughout Jaguar Range, all, all connected. But we wanted to cover the basics. We couldn't do all 18 countries unless we were spending 10 years at it. We wanted to cover the skeleton. If everything else got lost, what's the least we would have to have of the Jaguar corridor to still maintain a genetic corridor from Mexico to Northern Argentina? And that's a 10 country backbone, a 10 country skeleton. Now of that skeleton, we have what we call bookends, incredibly important countries which, which are at the beginning, at the end, and in the middle. The beginning country of the most important, the northernmost, is Mexico. Incredible range of habitats, a lot of area. The, the, other, the other biggest country, kind of the India for jaguars, because India has the most wild tigers left in the world, Africa, of course, has the most lion. The country with the most jaguars left in the world is Brazil. And Br Brazil has some of the highest densities, and it's got some of the biggest problems with, the, with, with cutting jaguar corridor. Then we have in the middle. Now, this is why we're in Colombia. We have Colombia, a country that, by all accounts, has done a great job in creating new protected areas, big protected areas big biodiversity. What they never looked at, however, until we came along, was movement corridors. Corridors trying to branch these different big protected areas. Because in the end, the protected area, if everything else has gone around it, just becomes a big safari park. You need to have connections, genetic connections, between these, these, these areas. And for Brazil, despite Brazil having such incredible protected areas in the Amazon, in the Llanos, in the Pantanal, and up in the Darien Gap, you could name huge areas, and yet it threatened to be broken by one place, San Lucas. San Lucas, a place that bridges northern Colombia and the Darien from everything south, going into Llanos and Amazon. If San Lucas, right now, we are working with the Colombian government, with, with the communities, it used to be a very hard place to work because of insurgency. Now it's a better place. We're trying to get a new protected area that the president has said he will do for San Lucas as a national park. We need another core area. We need at least a home for the Jaguars to move between Central America and South America. If that is not done, you could have all the biggest parks you want in the country, but you're going to have broken this 18-country Jaguar corridor in Colombia. That's why we're here right now. After I speak with you, that's our next part of the journey, heading to San Lucas. Karen, is there a corridor between Honduras and Panama, and have you, you, you explored it? Good question. Honduras and Panama have one of the best corridors between them that you can possibly imagine. This is where Howard and I and our team and the, the, the Colombian team have just come from. We made it to, it's not an easy area to go to, 
it's not we 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 had to get permission from the military we, we, we had to be be accompanied by the military there, there's still some level of drug trafficking in the area so we had to be quite careful but that's where we had to go because often where people are afraid to go are places where the jaguars thrive and this is one of them between honduras and panama we have a place called the Darien Gap. Well, part of it, part of not that, that, that the, the Darien Gap is further south between Panama and Colombia. But between Honduras and Panama, actually, we have another very tricky piece of the corridor that could be broken at any time. We flew into Honduras, into San Pedro Sula, which has been known in the recent past as the murder capital of the world. Yet there are jaguars walking through the forest on the edge of this city because people are afraid to go into those forests due to the drug trafficking. The, the areas at the border are a little tricky in terms of what we're going to have to do, but so far, so far, amazingly, since we've discovered the Jaguar Corridor, there have been no, no known breaks in the Jaguar Corridor. And we, we have a lot of hope that no country wants to break this incredible 18-country corridor, the only kind of corridor of its kind for any large mammal in the world. And every country that's a part of it should be very proud to be a part of it. So we hope to maintain that as long as we can into the future and guarantee that jaguars will not go the way of tigers and lions and leopards and be so endangered that we're talking about how to save the last few instead of talking about how to, how to keep on living big natural populations. Cody. How effective is an estorador like that you mentioned in your book, Jaguar, and are they still a tool used by locals? I don't know what an estorador is. We're going to have to have clarification on that one, Cody. I'm not quite sure what you're talking about, an estorador. We might have spelt it wrong on our end. Um, the, 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 let me see. Oh, that's right. It's a Jaguar caller. It's, it's a Jaguar caller. You got me on that one, Cody. I totally forgot, but you're right. It's a Jaguar caller. We've used them numerous times. How effective are they? You, you, you know, they're, Jaguars are very curious. All the big cats are very curious. I believe you can make almost any kind of a strange noise at night out where jaguars are, and you can bring in a jaguar. I've met a few old Mayans, and I have got my own jaguar collar made of a calabash and banana peel and deer hide. But, but to me, I don't believe a jaguar thinks it's another jaguar. I think they often know that it's just a very strange sound, maybe something close to a jaguar, and they come in to, to investigate it. But I also believe that jaguars are curious enough to where if you make a sound, if, if you get into their environment and make a sound that is different enough to, to what they're used to, they will come in and investigate it. We've used bamboo, blowing into bamboo as jaguar callers in the Pantanal. I've seen uh, hunters use pigtail buckets, putting pigtail buckets over their head and just blowing, making sounds in pigtail buckets. I've seen people use every kind of uh, shape and figure just to make a kind of deep guttural sound. And that that seemed, and it always has brought in jaguars, or at least we would get to hear jaguars vocalize near us, saying, just leave us alone, go away. Kenneth, Kenneth asks, 
Where's the best place to see Jaguars in the wild? Good. You, you threw me a softball, Kenneth, after I got embarrassed by not knowing the name of the Jaguar caller. The best place to see Jaguars in the wild, the best place, there are numerous places which are now adapting and acclimating Jaguars for tourists. But the absolute best place to see a Jaguar in the wild is the Pantanal in Brazil during, dur during dry season months. Because during the dry season months, all the prey and thus all the jaguars come around two major waterways. And they can be found sunning themselves there in the early morning, lying there for, for coolness in the early evening with the evening breezes. What's interesting is it doesn't mean they're less wary of humans. They're just used to having humans passing by in boats, fishing boats, usually for, for a century it's been going on. So if you're in a boat in the river, fairly close to them, they don't mind you. It's just like being on, on an elephant when you go into tiger country. You can go right up to a tiger on elephant back, but if you step down off of that elephant or try walking towards that, that tiger, that tiger will run away from you. If you put the boat on land, or you try to swim over to the, to the jaguar, which I, we wouldn't recommend because of the caiman and piranhas, but if you try to get to that jaguar up close and personal, even in the boat, it gets up and moves away from you. It's got its own personal space. But you can take pictures, all the most beautiful pictures you are seeing now of jaguars eating caiman, jaguars eating capybara, Jaguars swimming, jaguars lying there in this beautiful pose. They're almost all coming from the Pantanal during dry season because some of the world's best photographers have discovered it and they're taking incredible photos of the jaguars there. So I would, I would welcome you. Panthera owns its own ranch there in the Pantanal and we have been one of the main movers to change people's attitudes to, to actually train tourist guards so they know how, how to space themselves from the Jaguar. We built a school for the local children so that cowboys don't have to send the, their children away. Now those local children are doing plays about Jaguars and other wildlife. Panthera has really had a major effect in, in the Pantanal and it's just the beginning. We would welcome you there. We have time for two more questions. Nicholas. <laughs> Nicholas, you ask me, me this all the time, every day on Facebook. Will you ever come to Bolivia? We have healthy populations of jaguars, but every day we're losing them. Nicholas, I know, I, I, I have known for a long time. Sadly, I've never been to Bolivia, and that's my, my problem. I have known for quite a while since working with WCS and seeing some of the surveys that WCS has done there that Bolivia has quite excellent big protected areas and with surprisingly large populations of, of jaguars. What I also know from people who have been coming to me very recently, in fact one wants to meet me next week is that Bolivia appears to be one of our biggest problematic areas in terms of people hunting jaguars to kill jaguars. And what appears to be the case, and I just have been told this, you know it personally, I'm sure, people are killing jaguars for their teeth, for their canines in Bolivia. I was told a canine goes for about $115, $120 a piece for, for a necklace, meaning one dead jaguar is worth about $500, which is quite a sum of money. That's what I was told, and it's the only, we, we do know, and it's for basically the Asian trade. We do know that there's some of this Asian trade elsewhere in, in some of the Guianas um, and a little in Belize, but Bolivia seems to have one of the, the worst problems right now for jaguars being killed for their parts in the same way tigers and lions are being killed for their parts. 
And that is incredibly disturbing to me. So yes, I desperately want to get to Bolivia. I would love to meet you and have you sh show me around because we know this is a serious problem and we'd hate to see Bolivia go the way of so, so, some of these rich tiger and lion areas where they were hunted down to just almost nothing. Veronica, last question. What happens when mountain lions and jaguar populations share the same territory? Who dominates? Good, good question, Veronica. Jaguars and mountain lions almost always share the same territory. That, uh, other than the fact that mountain lions have a larger range, so, so mountain lions range all the way up into the United States and, and Canada into areas where no longer jaguars roam, but where jaguars live, mountain lions live as well. On our team in Panthera, we're fortunate to have not only one of the world's jaguar experts, but he's also one of the world's mountain lion experts, Howard Quigley, who has spent years working on mountain lions and knows them better than almost anybody in the world. And he has spent as much time as me, 30 plus years, working on, working on jaguars. But, but let me tell you what I have experienced. Personally, when, when I was working in the jungles in Belize, Jaguars and mountain lions lived sympatrically. They coexisted. When the jaguars left, I would find jaguar tracks, jaguar feces, jaguar markings all the time on the roads, on the dirt, uh, timber roads and trails. When the jaguar left, but that was just one piece of its home range. When it left that area to go to another part of its home range, that's when I would see the puma tracks on that piece of road and the puma feces and droppings. They overlap, but there was mutual avoidance, whether it was by both, both pumas and jaguars do talk a lot, but they don't talk in our language. They have a lot of marking, they have vocalizations, they have sense. So there's a whole communication going on right under our noses which if you know what to look for, you can see, if not understand, about, about well, the big males in the area. So, so stay out of this area, go back to your area, or yes, a female wants to come in that area, a big new, new male's there. They communicate because they don't want to fight. If you fight in the tropical jungle, an animal which ends up even with a small scratch is a dead animal due to parasites and, and the wound just not healing. So cats in many ways are smarter than humans. They, they have perfected their hunting and killing skills, but the last thing they want to do is fight, is get a wound, because they know in a fight there's no real winner. Instead, they do mutual avoidance. If they fight, they have to fight. Uh, generally, now pumas, Pumas are a rugged, all because jaguars are stocky like a sumo wrestler. If a jaguar got its teeth sunk into a neck of a puma, that puma is dead on the spot. But pumas are quicker, sometimes bigger. I wouldn't want to be a jaguar trying to take down a puma either. They're both incredibly capable cats. But in general, from what we have seen in the field, pumas Pumas are able to stand a little drier habitat than jaguars. Jaguars need water and wetter areas more. Pumas are in a little drier areas. Where they coexist, pumas generally seem to avoid jaguars. And jaguars, when they leave, pumas come in that same area. Their ranges can overlap. They're not competing so much because jaguars go after bigger prey, the peccary and the deer. Pumas, especially in the tropics, which are a little smaller, go after a lot of smaller prey so that they live well together. Okay, one bonus question I'm told we have also. Michelle asks, will the United States ever become a part of the Jaguar Corridor? Well, Michelle, it's not impossible. It will be impossible if we build a wall. If we build a wall, then it just can't happen. 
because the wall stops everything. It, it would be very difficult even without a wall, however, because right now, to the best of our knowledge, Jaguars haven't lived, haven't lived as, as breeding populations in the United States since the early part of the 20th century, since the early 1900s. There, there was a mother and cub seen in the area of the Grand Canyon around 1950. That's the best sighting uh, up to that time. What you need for the population to reestablish, now several good things are happening. On part of our earlier Jaguar walk, we were in northern Mexico visiting the Northern Jaguar Reserve, which is the northernmost population of breeding Jaguars. That place is beautiful. It's hot, it's rugged. I don't know why Jaguars like it, but it's, it's got Jaguars there and they're breeding. And, and there are people who are really taking good care of it and expanding. That's not far from the US border, maybe 50 miles. Right now, the animals that seem to be coming over into the United States appear to be, to the best of the ones we can identify, dispersing males. Young males who get basically kicked out have to find their own area to settle down in, and they leave and they travel long distances. They need, they, they're the ones usually coming over into the United States. They could live there, roam around a while, have plenty of food, but, but they don't have a mate and they'll eventually leave or come back or die lonely. For the females, for the population to get reestablished, we need females. Now the females don't disperse like the males do. Where the potential is, is that as the Jaguar Reserve, 50 miles or so, or 100 miles from the US border, starts to expand, starts to kind of jump closer and closer so that there's breeding populations closer and closer to the U.S. border, you might be able to have male and female male jaguars at first being on the border, which is exactly what's happening in, between China and Russia. There are populations of tigers and leopards right on the border of Russia and China, which neither country is their home. They go back and forth. That could happen with the United States and with Mexico if the wall is not built. And it might not happen even if the wall is not built, but it, but it stands a chance. It, it's possible. Okay, I have really enjoyed this. It's a terrific break from sweating out in the, out in the jungle and climbing mountains to the, to the Colombia-Panama border. But it's been an exciting time, and I hope it's been good for, for all of you. We'll do it again when we have been over more country and no more. What I would like is that if you're really interested in this, if you're interested in, in what we're doing, why we're doing it, where we're going, if you're interested in me, in our pictures, we're doing some incredible things with incredible people. There are so many heroes out there, so many unsung heroes living every day, just trying to do good things. You can watch these people, you can follow them. You can be with us on this journey. Just go to it, we have a brand new platform, a brand new website, which is for you. Please go on to journeyofthejaguar.org. That's journeyofthejaguar.org. And follow us through what is going to be at least a three year journey through where Jaguars have moved since they escaped the, the ice ages of the Pleistocene. Thank you very much.